Gramsci's Black Marks, Wither the Slave in Civil Society. The black experience in this country has been a phenomenon without analog. Eugene Genovese, Boston Review, October, November, 1993. A decisive antagonism. Any serious consideration of the question of antagonistic identity formation, a formation, the mass mobilization of which can precipitate a crisis in the institutions and assumptive logic which undergird the United States of America, must come to grips with the limitations of Marxist discourse in the face of the black subject. This is because the United States is constructed at the intersection of both a capitalist and white supremacist matrix. And the privileged subject of Marxist discourse is a subaltern who is approached by variable capital, a wage. In other words, Marxism assumes a subaltern structured by capital, not by white supremacy. In this scenario, racism is read off the base, as it were, as being derivative of political economy. This is not an adequate subalternity from which to think the elaboration of antagonistic identity formation. Not if we are truly committed to elaborating a theory of crisis, crisis at the crux of America's institutional and discursive strategies. The scandal with which the black subject position threatens Gramscian discourse is manifest in the subject's ontological disarticulation of Gramscian categories. Work, progress, production, exploitation, hegemony, and historical self-awareness. By examining the strategy and structure of the black subject's absence in Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks, and by contemplating the black subject's incommensurability with the key categories of Gramscian theory, we come face to face with three unsettling consequences. Firstly, the black American subject imposes a radical incoherence upon the assumptive logic of Gramscian discourse. In other words, she, he implies a scandal. Secondly, the black subject reveals Marxism's inability to think white supremacy as the base, and in so doing, calls into question Marxism's claim to elaborate a comprehensive, or in the words of Antonio Gramsci, decisive antagonism. Stated another way, Gramsci and Marxism is able to imagine the subject which transforms her himself into a mass of antagonistic identity formations, formations which can precipitate a crisis in wage slavery exploitation and or hegemony, but it is asleep at the wheel when asked to provide enabling antagonisms toward unwaged slavery, despotism, and or terror. Finally, we begin to see how Marxism suffers from a kind of conceptual anxiety, a desire for socialism on the other side of crisis, a society which does away not with the category of worker, but with the imposition workers suffer under the approach of variable capital. In other words, the mark of its conceptual anxiety is in its desire to democratize work and thus help keep in place, ensure the coherence of, the reformation and enlightenment foundational values of productivity and progress. This is a crowding out scenario for other post-revolutionary possibilities, i.e. idleness. Why interrogate Gramsci with the political predicament and desire of the black and subject position in the Western Hemisphere. Because the prison notebook's intentionality and general reception lay claim to universal applicability. Neither Gramsci nor his spiritual progenitors in the form of scholars or activists say that the Gramscian project sows the seeds of freedom for whites only. Instead, they claim that deep within the organicity of the organic intellectual is the organic black intellectual, the organic Chinese intellectual, the organic South American intellectual, and so on. That though there are historical and cultural variances, there is a structural consistency which elaborates all organic intellectuals and undergirds all resistance. Through what strategies does the black subject destabilize, emerge as the unthought, and thus the scandal of, historical materialism? How does the black subject distort and expand Marxist categories in ways that create, in the words of Hortense Spillers, a distended organizational calculus? We could put the question another way. How does the black subject function within the American desiring machine differently than the quintessential Gramscian subaltern, the worker?
Before going more deeply into how the black subject position destabilizes or disarticulates the categories foundational to the assumptive logic of Marxism, it's important to allow ourselves a digression that attempts to schematize the Gramscian project on its own terms. The Gramscian Dream Students of struggle return, doggedly, to the prison notebooks for insights regarding how to bring about a revolution in a society in which state, capital, formations are in some way protected by the trenches of civil society. It is this outer perimeter, this discursive trench, constructed by an ensemble of private initiatives, activities, and an ensemble of posable questions, hegemony, which must be reconfigured before a revolution can take the form of a frontal assault. But this trench, called civil society, is not, for Gramsci, in and of itself the bane of the working class. Instead, it represents a terrain to be occupied, assumed and appropriated in a pedagogic project of transforming common sense into good sense. This notion of destruction-construction is a war of position which involves agitating within civil society in a revolutionary movement that builds qualitatively new social relationships. A war of position is a struggle that engages on a wide range of fronts in which the state, as normally defined, is only one aspect. For Gramsci, a war of position is the most decisive form of engagement, because it is the form in which bourgeois power is exercised, and victory on these fronts makes possible, or conclusive, a frontal attack or war of movement. Anne Shostak Sassoon Approaches to Gramsci, 1982. In other words, for revolution to be feasible, the proletariat must be hailed, in the Althusserian sense of the word, to a revolutionary position. And for Gramsci, it is within this trench between the economic structure and the state, with its legislation and its coercion, within civil society, that this hailing must take place. Again, for that to happen, the trench, civil society, must be transformed. A war of position can be summed up as a process by which workers struggling against capital and the state forge organs of working-class civil society, which in turn elaborate organic intellectuals capable of assimilating certain traditional intellectuals. And throughout the whole process, all the struggle's personnel, if you will, fashion a discourse on all of civil society's fronts, through which they eventually become hegemonic. In this way, the common sense, the spontaneous consent of the ruled toward the ideology of the rulers, finds its good sense, fragments of antagonistic sentiment, transformed into an ensemble of questions which, prior to this process, could not be posed, i.e., what is to be done. Common sense, by way of contrast, is an effect of the prevailing formamentis. It involves... The notion that the social order can be perfected through fair and open competition, and it seeks to remedy problems and injustices through reforms fought for and negotiated among competing groups within the existing overall structure, thus leaving the juridical administrative apparatus of the state more or less intact. It makes the revolutionary idea of eliminating competitiveness, i.e. greed, as the primary motivating force in society seem unreasonable, unrealistic, or even dangerous. Joseph Buttigieg, Gramsci on Civil Society, 2003. The pedagogical implications are self-evident. For Gramsci, this is a process through which various strata of the class struggling for dominance achieve historical self-awareness. And for this reason, civil society itself is not the bane of workers because its constituent elements, as opposed to the way those elements are combined, are not anti-worker. Therefore, Gramsci's purpose is not to repress civil society or to restrict its space, but rather to develop a revolutionary strategy, a war of position, that would be employed precisely in the arena of civil society, with the aim of disabling the coercive apparatus of the state, gaining access to political power, and creating the conditions that could give rise to a consensual society, wherein no individual or group is reduced to a subaltern. Buttigieg. At this moment the end of the subalternity by way of the destruction of the ruling class, the state becomes ethical. Gramsci writes, 
Every state is ethical in as much as one of its most important functions is to raise the great mass of the population to a particular cultural and moral level, a level or type which corresponds to the needs of the productive forces for development, and hence to the interests of the ruling classes. He suggests that schools and courts perform this function for the state, before describing the so-called private initiatives and activities which form the hegemonic apparatuses of the ruling class. But these private initiatives, i.e. newspapers, cinema, guild associations, are not ethical precisely because of their ability to exist in tandem with the state and or due to their function as its outright handmaidens, i.e. lobbyists, PACs. Therefore, only the social group, his code word for class, in an attempt to secure the notebook's safe passage past Mussolini's prison censors, that poses the end of the state and its own end as the target to be achieved, can create an ethical state, i.e. one which tends to put an end to the internal divisions of the ruled and to create a technically and morally unitary social organism. In other words, civil society can only be the site of universal freedom when it extends to the point of becoming the state, that is, when the need for political society is obviated, the phenomenon of subordination occurs without coercion. It is an instance of power that is exercised and extended in civil society, resulting in the hegemony of one class over others who, for their part, acquiesce to it willingly, or, as Gramsci puts it, spontaneously. Buttigieg. What appears to be spontaneous is a product of consent manufactured by intellectuals of the ruling class. Again, not only is consent manufactured, but is backed up by coercion in reserve, what Gramsci calls political society. The courts, the army, the police, and for the past 57 years, the atomic bomb. It is true that Gramsci acknowledges no organic division between political society and civil society. He makes the division for methodological purposes. There is one organism, the modern bourgeois liberal state, but there are two qualitatively different kinds of apparatuses. On the one hand, the ensemble of so-called private associations and ideological invitations to participate in a wide and varied play of consensus-making strategies, civil society, and on the other hand, a set of enforcement structures which kick in when that ensemble is regressive or can no longer lead, political society. But Gramsci would have us believe not that white positionality emerges and is elaborated on the terrain of civil society and encounters coercion when civil society is not expansive enough to embrace the idea of freedom for all, but that all positionalities emerge and are elaborated on the terrain of civil society. Gramsci does not racialize this birth, elaboration and stunting, or re-emergence of human subjectivity because civil society supposedly elaborates all subjectivity, and so there is no need for such specificity. Anglo-American Gramscians, like Buttigieg and Sassoon, and U.S. activists in the anti-globalization movement, whose unspoken grammar is predicated on Gramsci's assumptive logic, continue this tradition of unraced positionality, which allows them to posit the valency of wars of position for blacks and whites alike. They assume that all subjects are positioned in such a way as to have their consent solicited and to be able to extend their consent spontaneously. This is profoundly problematic if only, leaving revolution aside for the moment, at the level of analysis. For it assumes that hegemony, with its three constituent elements, influence, leadership, consent, is the modality which must be either inculcated or breached if one is to either avoid or incur, respectively, the violence of the state. However, one of the primary claims of this essay is that, whereas the consent of black people may seem to be called upon, its withdrawal does not precipitate a crisis in authority. Put another way, the transformation of black people's acquiescent common sense into revolutionary good sense is an extenuating circumstance, but not the catalyst of state violence against black people. State violence against the black body, as Martineau and Sexton suggest in their introduction, is not contingent. It is structural, and above all, gratuitous. Therefore, Gramscian wisdom cannot imagine the emergence, elaboration, and stunting of a subject by way, not of the contingency of violence resulting in a crisis of authority, but by way of direct relations of force. 
This is remarkable and unfortunate, given the fact that the emergence of the slave, the subject effect of an ensemble of direct relations of force, marks the emergence of capitalism itself. Let us put a finer point on it. Violence towards the black body is the precondition for the existence of Gramsci's single entity, the modern bourgeois state, with its divided apparatus, political society and civil society. This is to say, violence against black people is ontological and gratuitous, as opposed to merely ideological and contingent. Furthermore, no magical moment, i.e. 1865, transformed paradigmatically the black body's relation to this entity. In this regard, the hegemonic advances within civil society by the left hold out no more possibility for black life than the coercive backlash of political society. What many political theorists have either missed or ignored is that a crisis of authority that might take place by way of a left expression of civil society further instantiates, rather than dismantles, the authority of whiteness. Black death is the modern bourgeois state's recreational pastime, but the hunting season is not confined to the time and place of political society. Blacks are fair game as a result of a progressively expanding civil society as well. Civil death in civil society. Capital was kick-started by the rape of the African continent. This phenomenon is central to neither Gramsci nor Marx. The theoretical importance of emphasizing this in the early 21st century is twofold. First, the socio-political order of the new world was kick-started by approaching a particular body, a black body, with direct relations of force, not by approaching a white body, with variable capital. Thus, one could say that slavery, the accumulation of black bodies regardless of their utility as laborers, Hartman, Johnson, through an idiom of despotic power, Patterson, is closer to capital's primal desire than is wage depression. The exploitation of unraced bodies, Marx, Lenin, Gramsci, that labor through an idiom of rational, symbolic, the wage, power. A relation of terror as opposed to a relation of hegemony. Secondly, today, late capital is imposing a renaissance of this original desire, direct relations of force, the prison industrial complex, the despotism of the unwaged relation, and this renaissance of slavery has, once again, as its structuring image in libidinal economy and its primary target in political economy, the black body. The value of reintroducing the unthought category of the slave by way of noting the absence of the black subject lies in the black subject's potential for extending the demand placed on state capital formations, because its reintroduction into the discourse expands the intensity of the antagonism. In other words, the slave makes a demand, which is an excess of the demand made by the worker. The worker demands that productivity be fair and democratic. Gramsci's new hegemony, Lenin's dictatorship of the proletariat. The slave, on the other hand, demands that production stop, stop without recourse to its ultimate democratization. Work is not an organic principle for the slave. The absence of black subjectivity from the crux of Marx's discourse is symptomatic of the discourse's inability to cope with the possibility that the generative subject of capitalism, the black body of the 15th and 16th centuries, and the generative subject that resolves late capital's over-accumulation crisis, the black, incarcerated body of the 20th and 21st centuries, do not reify the basic categories which structure Marx's conflict. The categories of work, production, exploitation, historical self-awareness, and, above all, hegemony. If by way of the black subject, we consider the underlying grammar of the question, what does it mean to be free? That grammar being the question, what does it mean to suffer? Then we come up against a grammar of suffering, not only in excess of any semiotics of exploitation, but a grammar of suffering beyond the signification itself. A suffering that cannot be spoken because the gratuitous terror of white supremacy is as much contingent upon the irrationality of white fantasies and shared pleasures as it is upon a logic, the logic of capital. It extends beyond textualization. When talking about this terror, Cornell West uses the term 
black invisibility and namelessness, to designate, at the level of ontology, what we are calling a scandal at the level of discourse. He writes, America's unrelenting assault on black humanity produced the fundamental condition of black culture, that of black invisibility and namelessness. On the crucial existential level relating to black invisibility and namelessness, the first difficult challenge and demanding discipline is to ward off madness and discredit suicide as a desirable option. A central preoccupation of black culture is that of confronting candidly the ontological wounds, psychic scars and existential bruises of black people while fending off insanity and self-annihilation. This is why the urtext of black culture is neither a word nor a book, not an architectural monument or a legal brief. Instead, it is a guttural cry and a wrenching moan, a cry not so much for help as for home, a moan less out of complaint than for recognition. Thus, the black subject position in America is an antagonism, a demand that cannot be satisfied through a transfer of ownership, organization, or of existing rubrics, whereas the Gramscian subject, the worker, represents a demand that can indeed be satisfied by way of a successful war of position, which brings about the end of exploitation. The worker calls into question the legitimacy of productive practices. The slave calls into question the legitimacy of productivity itself. From the positionality of the worker, the question, what does it mean to be free, is raised. But the question hides the process by which the discourse assumes a hidden grammar, which has already posed and answered the question, what does it mean to suffer? And that grammar is organized around the categories of exploitation, unfair labor relations or wage slavery. Thus, exploitation, wage slavery, is the only category of oppression which concerns Gramsci. Society, Western society, thrives on the exploitation of the Gramscian subject. Full stop. Again, this is inadequate because it would call white supremacy racism and articulate it as a derivative phenomenon of the capitalist matrix, rather than incorporating white supremacy as a matrix constituent to the base, if not the base itself. What I am saying is that the insatiability of the slave demand upon existing structures means that it cannot find its articulation within the modality of hegemony, influence, leadership, consent. The black body cannot give its consent because generalized trust, the precondition for the solicitation of consent, equals racialized whiteness. Lyndon Barrett. Furthermore, as Patterson points out, Slavery is natal alienation by way of social death, which is to say that a slave has no symbolic currency or material labor power to exchange. A slave does not enter into a transaction of value, however asymmetrical, but is subsumed by direct relations of force, which is to say that a slave is an articulation of a despotic irrationality, whereas the worker is an articulation of a symbolic rationality. White supremacy's despotic irrationality is as foundational to American institutionality as capitalism's symbolic rationality because, as West writes, it dictates the limits of the operation of American democracy, with black folk the indispensable sacrificial lamb vital to its sustenance. Hence, black subordination constitutes the necessary condition for the flourishing of American democracy, the tragic prerequisite for America itself. This is, in part, what Richard Wright meant when he noted the Negro is America's metaphor. And it is well known that a metaphor comes into being through a violence that kills, rather than merely exploits, the object, so that the concept might live. West's interventions help us see how Marxism can only come to grips with America's structuring rationality, what it calls capitalism, or political economy but cannot come to grips with America's structuring irrationality. The libidinal economy of white supremacy and its hyper-discursive violence that kills the black subject so that the concept, civil society, may live. In other words, from the incoherence of black death, America generates the coherence of white life. This is important when considering the Gramscian paradigm and its progenitors in the world of US social movements today, which is so dependent on the empirical status of hegemony and civil society, 
Struggles over hegemony are seldom, if ever, a signifying. At some point, they require coherence. They require categories for the record, which means they contain the seeds of anti-blackness. Let us illustrate this by way of a hypothetical scenario. In the early part of the 20th century, civil society in Chicago grew up, if you will, around emerging industries such as meatpacking. In his notes on Americanism and Fordism, Gramsci explores the scientific management of Taylorism, the prohibition on alcohol, and Fordist interventions into the working-class family, which form the ideological, value-laden grid of civil society in places like turn-of-the-century Chicago. It is worth drawing attention to the way in which industrialists, Ford in particular, have been concerned with the sexual affairs of their employees and with their family arrangements in general. One should not be misled, any more than in the case of prohibition, by the puritanical appearance assumed by this concern. The truth is that the new type of man demanded by the rationalization of production and work cannot be developed until the sexual instinct has been suitably regulated and until it too has been rationalized. The discourse of this suitable regulation and rationalization underwrote the common sense which hailed the proletariat through the influence, leadership, and spontaneous consent of an ensemble of questions, hegemony, and simultaneously crowded out the project of transforming proletarian shards and fragments of good sense into a revolutionary project. Gramsci called it a psychophysical adaptation to the new industrial structure, pre-crash, aimed for through high wages. And it meant that the working class struggle was pre-hegemony, existing, he suggested, still in defense of craft rights against industrial liberty. In this scenario, a war of position has yet to commence because even unions, the vanguard of the working class, were simply the corporate expression of the rights of qualified crafts, and therefore the industrialists' attempts to curb them, had a certain progressive aspect. Gramsci's preceding diagnosis is indicative of his well-known pessimism of the intellect, but it also contains the glimmer of his optimism of the will. For the unflinching nature of his analysis illustrates the moves that the worker must make against Americanism and Fordism, in order to bring about the flowering of the superstructure, a war of position, so that the fundamental question of hegemony can be posed. But we must ask ourselves, for whom does his analysis provide an optimism of the will? Most American political theorists and social movement activists have not pried open even the crevice of a doubt about the Gramscian dream's applicability to all U.S. positions, which Gramsci himself acknowledges when he writes... The absence of the European historical phase, marked even in the economic field by the French Revolution, has left American popular masses in a backward state. To this should be added the absence of national homogeneity, the mixture of race cultures, the Negro question. For the sake of our scenario, the impact of a successful war of position on our hypothetical meatpacking plant let us not refer to the question as the Negro question. Instead, let us call it the cow question. Let us suppose that the superstructure has finally flowered and that throughout the various fronts where the power to pose the question held by the private initiatives and associations elaborated by the industrialists, hegemony has now been called into question and a war of position has been transposed into a war of maneuver. The scandal with which the black subject position threatens Gramscian discourse is manifest in the subject's ontological disarticulation of Gramscian categories. Work, progress, production, exploitation, hegemony, and historical self-awareness. Gramsci's notes on Americanism and Fordism demonstrate his acumen in expressing how the drama of value is played out in civil society, i.e. the family, away from the slaughterhouse, while being imbricated and foundational to the class exploitation which workers experience within the slaughterhouse. But still we must ask, what about the cows? The cows are not being exploited, they are being accumulated and, if need be, killed. The desiring machine of capital and white supremacy manifest in society two dreams, 
imbricated but, I would argue, distinct. The dream of worker exploitation and the dream of black accumulation and death. Nowhere in Gramsci can one find sufficient reassurance that once the dream of worker exploitation has been smashed, once the superstructure, civil society, has flowered and the question of hegemony has been posed, the dream of black accumulation and death will be thrown into crisis as well. I submit that death of the black body is a foundational to the life of American civil society, just as foundational as it is to the drama of value, wage slavery, and b foundational to the fantasy space of desires which underwrite the industrialist's hegemony and which underwrite the worker's potential for and realization of what Gramsci calls good sense. Thus, a whole set of new and difficult, perhaps un-Gramscian questions emerge at the site of our meatpacking plant in the throes of its war of manoeuvre. First, how would the cows fare under a dictatorship of the proletariat? Would cows experience freedom at the mere knowledge that they're no longer being slaughtered in an economy of exchange predicated on exploitation? In other words, would it feel more like freedom to be slaughtered by a workers' collective where there was no exploitation, where the working day was not a minute longer than the time it took to reproduce workers' needs and pleasures, as opposed to being slaughtered in the exploitative context of that dreary old nine-to-five. Secondly, in the river of common sense, does the flotsam of good sense have a message in a bottle that reads, Workers of the world become vegetarians. Finally, is it enough to just stop eating meat? In other words, can the Gramscian worker simply give the cows their freedom, grant them emancipation, and have it be meaningful to the cows? The cows need some answers before they raise a hoof for the flowering of the superstructure. The cows bring us face to face with the limitations of a Gramscian formulation of the question, what does it mean to be free? By revealing the limitations of the ways in which it formulates the question, what does it mean to suffer? Because exploitation, rather than accumulation and death, is at the heart of the Gramscian question, what does it mean to suffer? And thus crowds out analysis of civil society's foundation of despotic terror and white pleasure by way of the accumulation of black bodies. The Gramscian question also functions as a crowding out scenario of the black subject herself, himself, and is indexical of a latent anti-blackness which black folks experience in the most sincere of social movements. So, when Buttigieg tells us that the struggle against the domination of the few over the many, if it is to be successful, must be rooted in a careful formulation of a counter-hegemonic conception of the social order, in the dissemination of such a conception, and in the formation of counter-hegemonic institutions, which can only take place in civil society and actually require an expansion of civil society. A chill runs down our spine. For this required expansion requires the intensification and proliferation of civil society's constituent element, black accumulation and death. No data for the categories. What does it mean to be positioned not as a positive term in a counter-hegemonic struggle, i.e. as a worker, but to be positioned in excess of hegemony, to be a catalyst which disarticulates the very rubric of hegemony, to be a scandal to its assumptive foundational logic, to threaten its discursive integrity. Why is American civil life, whether regressive or expansive, predicated on black death? Why are black folk the indispensable sacrificial lamb vital to its sustenance? In White Writing, on the culture of letters in South Africa, J. M. Kutsi examines the positionality of the Khoisan in what he calls the early discourse of the Cape. Travel, ethnographic and scholarly writing of Europeans between the late 16th and 18th centuries. Those Europeans who encountered the Khoisan during the period came face to face with an anthropological scandal, a being without recognisable Customs, religion, medicine, dietary patterns, culinary habits, sexual mores, means of agriculture, and most significantly, without character. 
without character because, according to the literature, they did not work, even when press-ganged into service by the whip, by the Bible, by the spectre of starvation, they showed no valuation of industry. The only remedy for this condition, according to one Cape writer, was terror, their annihilation. Wherever the European went in South Africa, the project of colonization was sutured, brokered, and fought with the help of discourse, and therefore, no matter how bloody it became, no matter how much force it necessitated, the project did not face the threat of incoherence. Africans like the Kosa, who were agriculturalists, provided European discourse with enough anthropological categories for the record so that, through various strategies of articulation, they could be known by the textual project, which was the accompaniment to the colonial project, but not the Khoisan. She, he, did not produce the necessary categories for the record, the play of signifiers that would allow for a sustainable semiotics. According to Kurtzi, European discourse has two structuring axes upon which its coherence depends. The historical axis, codes distributed along the axis of temporality and events, and the anthropological axis, an axis of cultural codes, it mattered very little which codes on either axis a particular indigenous community was perceived to possess. And possession is the operative word here, for these codes act as a kind of currency. What matters is that the community has some play of difference along both axes, enough differences to construct taxonomies that can be investigated, identified, and named by the discourse. Without this, the discourse literally can't function. The discourse is reinvigorated by the momentary tension which ensues when an unknown entity presents itself, but this tension becomes a crisis, a scandal, when the entity remains unknown. Something unspeakable occurs. Not to possess a particular code along the anthropological axis or along the historical axis is akin to not having a gene for brown hair or green eyes on an X or Y chromosome. By not possessing the historical or anthropological axis altogether is akin to not having the chromosome itself. The first predicament throws the notion of what kind of human into play. The second predicament throws the notion of humanity itself into crisis. Whereas even the Chosa presented the discourse of the Cape with both an anthropological and historical play of difference, the Khoi San presented the discourse of the Cape with an anthropological void. Without those textual categories of dress, diet, medicine, crafts, physical appearance, and most importantly work, the Khoi San stood in refusal of the invitation to become anthropological man. She, he was the void in discourse which could only be designated as idleness. An idleness had been a counterposed to work, and b. criminalized and designated with the status of sin long before the Europeans reached the Cape. It was not a signifier within anthropology, but the death knell of humanity and spirituality itself. Thus the Khoisan status within discourse was not the status of an opponent or an interlocutor, but was the status of an unspeakable scandal. His, her position within the discourse was one of disarticulation, for he, she did little or nothing to fortify and extend the interlocutory life of the discourse. Just as the Khoisan presented the discourse of the Cape with an anthropological scandal, so the black subject in the United States, the slave, presents both Marxism and American social movement practice with a historical scandal. Every group provides American discourse with acceptable categories for the record, a play of signifiers, points of articulation, except black Americans. How is black incoherence in the face of the historical axis germane to the black experience as a phenomenon without analogue? A sample list of codes mapped out by an American subject's historical axis, including the following. 1. Rights or entitlements. Here, even Native Americans provide categories for the record when one thinks of how the Iroquois 
Constitution, for example, becomes the American Constitution. Two, sovereignty, whether that state be one the subject left behind, or one, once again, as in the case of American Indians, which was taken by force and dint of broken treaties. White supremacy has made good use of the Indian subject's positionality, a positionality which fortifies and extends the interlocutory life of America as a coherent, albeit genocidal, idea, because treaties are forms of articulation, discussions brokered between two groups presumed to possess the same kind of historical currency, sovereignty. The code of sovereignty can have both a past and future history, if you'll excuse the oxymoron. When one considers that there are 150 Native American tribes with applications in at the BIA for federal recognition, that they might qualify for funds harvested from land stolen from them. In other words, the curse of being able to generate categories for the record manifests itself in Indians' ability to be named by white supremacy, that they might receive a small cash advance on funds, land, which white people stole from them. 3. Immigration Another code which maps the subject onto the American historical axis, narratives of arrival based on collective volition and premeditated desire. Chicano, chicana, subject positions, can fortify and extend the interlocutory life of America as an idea because racial conflict can be articulated across the various contestations of the legitimacy of arrival, immigration, or of sovereignty, i.e. the Mexican-American War. In this way, whites and chicanos, chicanas, both generate data for this category. Slavery is the great leveler of the black subject's positionality. The black American subject does not generate historical categories of entitlement, sovereignty, and or immigration for the record. We are off the record. To the data-generating demands of the historical axis, we present a virtual blank, much like the Khoisan's virtual blank presented to the data-generating demands of the anthropological axis. The work of Hortense Spillers on black female sexuality corroborates these findings. Spillers' conclusions regarding the black female subject and the discourse of sexuality are in tandem with ours regarding the black ungendered subject and the question of hegemony, and in addition, unveil the ontological elements which black women and men share, a scandal in the face of new world hegemony. Quote, the black female is the veritable nemesis of degree and difference. Having encountered what they understand as chaos, the empowered need not name further, since chaos is sufficient naming within itself. I am not addressing the black female in her historical apprenticeship as inferior being, but rather the paradox of non-being. Under the sign of this particular historical order, black female and black male are absolutely equal. Spillers. Interstices. A Small Drama of Words. 1984. In the socio-political order of the New World, the black body is a captive body, marked and branded from one generation to the next. A body on which, quote, any hint or suggestion of a dimension of ethics, of relatedness between human personality and its anatomical features, between one human personality and another, between human personality and cultural institutions, is lost. To that extent, the procedures adopted for the captive flesh demarcate a total objectification as the entire captive community becomes a living laboratory. End quote. The gratuitous violence begun in slavery, hand in hand with the absence of data for the New World historical axis, rights, entitlement, sovereignty, immigration, as a result of slavery, positions black subjects in excess of Gramsci's fundamental categories, i.e. labor, exploitation, historical self-awareness. For these processes of subjectification are assumed by those with the semiotics of analogy already in hand, the currency of exchange through which a dimension of relatedness between one human personality and another, between human personality and cultural institutions, can be established.
Thus, the black subject imposes a radical incoherence upon the assumptive logic of Gramscian discourse. She, he, implies a scandal. Total objectification in contradistinction to human possibility, however slim, as in the case of working-class hegemony, that human possibility appears. It is this scandal which places black subjectivity in a structurally impossible position, outside of the natural articulations of hegemony. But it also places hegemony in a structurally impossible position, because our presence works back upon the grammar of hegemony and threatens it with incoherence. If every subject, even the most massacred subjects, Indians, are required to have analogues within the nation's structuring narrative, and one very large significant subject, the subject upon which the nation's drama and value is built, is a subject whose experience is without analogue. Then, by that subject's very presence, all other analogues are destabilized. Lest we think of the black body as captive only until the mid-19th century, Spillers reminds us that the marking and branding, the total objectification, are as much a part of the present as they were of the past. Quote, even though the captive flesh body has been liberated, and no one need pretend that even the quotation marks do not matter, dominant symbolic activity, the ruling episteme that releases the dynamics of naming and valuation, remains grounded in the originating metaphors of captivity and mutilation, so that it is as if neither time nor history nor historiography and its topics shows movement, as the human subject is murdered, over and over again, by the passions of a bloodless and anonymous archaism, showing itself in endless disguise. Herein, the concept of civil war takes on a comprehensive and structural, as opposed to merely eventful, connotation. Conclusion Civil society is the terrain where hegemony is produced, contested, mapped and the invitation to participate in hegemony's gestures of influence, leadership, and consent is not extended to the black subject. We live in the world, but exist outside of civil society. This structurally impossible position is a paradox because the black subject, the slave, is vital to civil society's political economy. She, he, kickstarts capital at its genesis and rescues it from its overaccumulation crisis at its end. Black death is its condition of possibility. Civil society's subaltern, the worker, is coded as waged, and wages are white. But Marxism has no account of this phenomenal birth and life-saving role played by the black subject. In Gramsci, we have consistent silence. The black body in the US is that constant reminder that not only can work not be reformed, but it cannot be transformed to accommodate all subjects. Work is a white category. The fact that millions upon millions of black people work misses the point. The point is we were never meant to be workers. In other words, capital, white supremacy's dream, did not envision us as being incorporated or incorporative. From the very beginning, we were meant to be accumulated and die. Work, i.e. the French shipbuilding industry and bourgeois civil society, which finally extended its progressive hegemony to workers and peasants to topple the aristocracy, was what grew up all around us. Twenty to sixty million seeds planted at the bottom of the Atlantic, Five million seeds planted in Dixie. Work sometimes registers as a historical component of blackness, but where whiteness is concerned, work registers as a constituent element. And the black body must be processed through a kind of civil death for this constituent element of whiteness to gain coherence. Today, at the end of the 20th century, we are still not meant to be workers, we are meant to be warehoused and die. Quote, the U.S. carceral network kills more blacks than any other ethnic group and constitutes an outside in U.S. political life. 
In fact, our society displays waves of concentric outside circles with increasing distances from bourgeois self-policing. The state routinely polices the unassimilable in the hell of lockdown, deprivation tanks, control units, and holes for political prisoners. Joy James, Resisting State Violence, 1996 Work, i.e. jobs for guards in the prison industrial complex and the shot in the arm it gives to faltering white communities, its positive re-territorialization of white space and its simultaneous de-territorialization of black space, is what grows up around our dead bodies once again. The chief difference today, compared to several hundred years ago, is that today our bodies are desired, accumulated, and warehoused, like the cows. Again, the chief constant to the dream is that, whereas desire for black labor power is often a historical component to the institutionality of white supremacy, it is not a constituent element. This paradox is not to be found at the crux of Gramsci's intellectual pessimism or his optimistic will. His concern is with subjects in a white and enough subject position that they are confronted by, or threatened with, the removal of a wage, be it monetary or social. But black subjectivity itself disarticulates the Gramscian dream as a ubiquitous emancipatory strategy, because Gramsci, like most US social movements, has no theory of, or solidarity with, the slave. Whereas the positionality of the worker enables the reconfiguration of civil society, the positionality of the slave exists as a destabilizing force within civil society, because civil society gains its coherence, the very tabula rasa upon which workers and industrialists struggle for hegemony, through the violence of black erasure. From the coherence of civil society, the black subject beckons with the incoherence of civil war. Civil war, then, becomes that unthought but never forgotten spectre waiting in the wings, the understudy of Gramsci's hegemony.